we just wrapped up a study on the effects of the stretch on muscle building. And as if you were wolf coaching, you get the scoop early. It turns out the stretch is more important than we thought. Let me break down the results and what they mean for your training. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching. Contrary to popular belief, actual scientist, actually involved in research. How crazy is that? Not one of those fake medical doctors you hear so much about. Now, this study took place in Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the lead researcher was Stian Larson, who took care of a lot of data collection. Here's what we did. To maximize the accuracy of our results, we used a within participant design, meaning that each participant trained their left and right limb differently. Now, dear viewer, you might be asking, why do that? Well, if you train your left and right limb differently with different interventions, we're interested in seeing whether one works better than the other. Because you're the same person, your sleep, stress, environmental factors, lifestyle factors impact both limbs similarly, which means that we're really comparing the effect of one intervention to the other, and not necessarily so much did one group have better lifestyle conditions than the other, and that's what's causing the results. We're able to wash out many of the potential confounders, essentially. And so we used a within subject design wherein participants trained one leg one way, the other leg the other way. One arm one way, the other arm the other way. And specifically, we looked at three different research questions in three different muscle groups. So there's a lot to unpack here. First, let's start with the quads in the leg extension exercise. Participants performed a unilateral or single leg leg extensions. With one of their legs, they performed them with 90 degrees of hip flexion. With the other leg, leg extensions were performed with 40 degrees of hip flexion. So your hips more extended. Why did we do this? Well, there are four muscles within your quads. Three of them, the vasti muscles, simply perform knee extension. So no matter what the hip positioning is, it shouldn't impact their growth. However, the fourth muscle, the rectus femoris, is also a hip flexor. So how your hips are positioned during the leg extension can actually impact the length of the rectus femoris. And so in the condition performing leg extensions with 40 degrees of hip flexion, the rectus femoris was more stretched than it was during the condition with a 90 degrees of hip flexion. So essentially, we were comparing doing leg extension with the rectus femoris more stretched versus more shortened. We measured vastus lateralis and rectus femoris growth via ultrasound at two different sites, one more proximal and one more distal. In this context, more proximal means closer to the hip and more distal closer to the knee. Participants performed leg extensions from 110 degrees of knee flexion to zero degrees of knee flexion. We took measurements of muscle size several times before the study and several times after the study to get a more accurate estimate of what true muscle size was. As far as analysis of results went, we adopted a Bayesian framework, which is a different type of analysis, essentially allowing us to make slightly more intuitive inferences regarding the results, or more intuitive conclusions. Before we go into the results, let me remind you, because the vast lateralis doesn't insert at the hip, the hip positioning shouldn't really cause differences in hypertrophy. However, for the rectus femoris, if the stretch is important, we should see more hypertrophy in the condition that stretched the rectus femoris more. First, let's break down the vastus lateralis results. In essence, we saw moderate evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Or to put it simply, we saw that there were no real differences in terms of growth between the two conditions. This applied to both the proximal site closer to the hip and the more distal site closer to the knee for the vastus lateralis. However, when it came to the rectus femoris, where in one condition it was being stretched more and in the other less, we saw pretty remarkable differences in terms of hypertrophy. At the more distal side, we saw 50% more growth when doing leg extensions with the hips more extended compared to more flexed. At the proximal side, we saw 170% more growth when doing leg extensions with the rectus femoris more stretched compared to less stretched. And because we used a Bayesian framework, we could also calculate the probability that there was an effect in favor of lengthened training being better than shortened training for the rectus femoris hip. And that probability was over 99.9%. So overwhelmingly likely that there is an effect here causing more hypertrophy. The takeaway from these results is that one, lengthening the rectus femoris more does cause substantially more growth, between 50 to 170% more growth depending on site. With the vast lateralis, on the other hand, there were no differences. Here's how this should inform your training. First, good leg extension machines are better than bad leg extension machines. And a good leg extension machine allows you to extend your hips, put the seat all the way back and extend your hips, almost be lying down. And two, allows you to get a deeper stretch at the bottom. If all your leg extension machine does is allow you to get to 90 degrees of knee flexion, it's not a great machine for hypertrophy. Another likely takeaway is that sissy squats and reverse Nordic curls are probably better exercises for hypertrophy compared to the leg extension. In the sissy squat and reverse Nordic curl, you're able to fully extend the hips, 
even further lengthening the rectus femoris. And if this study is anything to go by, extending your hips more, further lengthening the rectus femoris, seems to be beneficial for hypertrophy. More of a stretch is beneficial. And we do actually have one study on the reverse Nordic curl finding substantial hypertrophy after performing it. So at the very least, there is evidence for the reverse Nordic curl being effective, and there's a very strong rationale with this study that doing reverse Nordic curls likely causes more hypertrophy, in my opinion, than leg extensions. With that being said, one question that does remain here is, is even more hip extension preferable? Because while we do see that going from 90 to 40 degrees caused more rectum hypertrophy by quite a bit, it is somewhat unclear whether fully extending the hips would cause even more. My hunch is it would, but that remains a somewhat unanswered question. The second muscle group we looked at was the calves. And in this case, we compared doing standing calf raises on a Smith machine with one leg in two conditions. In condition one, participants simply performed unilateral standing calf raises on the Smith machine until they couldn't get another full rep get that peak squeeze at the very top. In the other condition, they continued past this point doing partial repetitions in the lengthened position until they either reached volitional failure, where they didn't want to keep going essentially, or when they simply couldn't lift up from that deep, deep stretch at the very bottom anymore, that peak dorsiflexion. Simply put, this study was designed to answer the question of does doing lengthened partials past full range of motion failure as a way to extend the set cause more growth compared to just ending the set when you can't get a full range of motion rep anymore in an exercise that is relatively short and biased. The hardest point of the calf raise and the place where you fail first is in that shortened position. So in a movement like that, does going past failure and just pumping out some lengthened partials cause more hypertrophy? Notably, this is the first study looking at this idea. We have plenty of studies comparing lengthened partials to shortened partials, lengthened partials to a full range of motion, etc., etc. But this is the first study that actually looked at doing lengthened partials after full range of motion failure and how that impacts hypertrophy. Many participants found getting to true failure when they couldn't get out of that deep stretch position at all anymore, very difficult, which is why we opted to allow participants to either end the set when they reached volitional failure or when they truly couldn't plant or flex their ankle anymore out of that deep stretch. In this case, we only measured hypertrophy of the calf muscle at one site in the gastrocnemius. And specifically, we saw 50% more hypertrophy when doing those partials after failure compared to just doing full range of motion. And in Bayesian terms, it was described as very strong evidence that there was an effect in favor of lengthened training over shortened training. The takeaway from this part of the study was that doing lengthened partials after failure in a shortened biased movement seems to be pretty effective for hypertrophy. Keep in mind this was done in the calves and it's somewhat unclear how this generalizes to the rest of the body. However, on principle, this means that whenever you're doing any back training, or dumbbell ladder raises for example, doing partials after you can't get another full rep might be beneficial for hypertrophy. And this raises two questions, and I think I have somewhat of an answer to them, but it does remain a somewhat open question. One, was it simply the fact that participants went past failure that caused more hypertrophy? Or two, was it the fact that it was lengthened partials? I'm inclined to say it's a bit of both. We have pretty compelling evidence at this point that focusing on the stretch is a good thing for hypertrophy. So if you going past failure on a shortened biased movement allows you to get more lengthened partials in and more stretched work in, that is a good thing for hypertrophy. However, we also have a meta-analysis by Robinson and colleagues showing that the closer you take a set to failure, the more hypertrophy that set causes. And so with some speculation, it would make some sense that going past failure would increase the stimulus even more but potentially at the expense of even more fatigue. And finally, we have a part of the study on bicep curls. Once again, participants performed training for their left and right arm differently. With one arm, they simply performed cable curls with their shoulder by their side. With the other arm, they actually went past neutral, hyperextending their shoulder, getting more of a stretch in both heads of the biceps. In both conditions, the cable was set up to be orthogonal to the line of pull, that is to say maximize the resistance at the fully stretched position. So for both conditions, the exercise was set up to be hardest in the relatively stretched position. They measured hypertrophy of the biceps brachii at two sites, one more proximal, one more distal. Essentially, this study was trying to answer the question of, in a movement that is already quite challenging in a relatively lengthened position, thus going from a decent stretch with your arm by your side to a deep maximum stretch with your arm behind you, increase hypertrophy. To make a long story short, no. It was pretty unclear that there were any major differences between groups. If you look very closely, you might say that there was very slightly more growth in the proximal area of the biceps, 
when doing the curl with your arm by your side in a more shortened position, and very slightly more distal hypertrophy when doing the curl with your arm behind you in the more lengthened position. But probably speaking, there were minimal differences, if any, and the probability that both of these measurements were in favor of the lengthened group was around 5%, and the probability that both of these measurements were in favor of the shortened group was about 17%. And in general, the analysis found that these results were in favor of the null hypothesis, if anything. They're not really being a difference here. So what this suggests is that if a movement is already hardest in the stretch position and already has a decent stretch, going from that to getting the maximum stretch in a muscle may not further increase hypertrophy. It also potentially suggests that having a lot of tension in that stretched position, so essentially having the movement be most difficult in that stretch, is more important than just pure muscle length. And that's in line with a previous study by Zabaleta Corley and colleagues where they compared the incline curl to the preacher curl. In the preacher curl, the resistance is greatest near the bottom or the fully stretched position of the movement. But because the arm is in front of you, the biceps aren't quite as lengthened as they would be during an incline curl. However, the incline curl has the opposite problem where the resistance curve is hardest near the top or the shortened part of the movement. And this study found the most favorable muscle growth from the preacher curl, the movement where tension was largest in the stretched position. And so, when given the choice, having a movement that is difficult in the stretch position might be more important for hypertrophy than just having a movement that stretches the muscle a lot. But ideally, you would probably have both. So, let me summarize the research question in each part of this study, the three parts, and give you the answer. First, in the quads and the leg extension, does lengthening a muscle, all else being equal, cause more hypertrophy? Yes, it seems to be the case in the case of the leg extension and the rectus femoris as it relates to hip angle. Second, in the case of the calves, does doing lengthened partials past full range of motion failure increase hypertrophy in a shortened biased movement in the calf specifically? Yes. So that means that on movements that are shortened biased, you might be better off doing partials after failure or doing partials in general. And finally, if a movement is already quite lengthened biased in terms of where it's most challenging, does stretching the muscle out even more past just a decent stretch cause more hypertrophy in the biceps in the case of the cable curl? No, it doesn't seem to be the case. And so the practical takeaways are, one, from the leg extension study, training a muscle in its more stretched position is better for hypertrophy in a likelihood. And this applies to the leg extension. Use better leg extension machines when you can, and potentially use the sissy squat or the reverse Nordic curl over the leg extension as they allow you to get a deeper stretch in your rectus femoris. Two, when it comes to the calves, consider doing some partials after failure in the lengthened position to increase hypertrophy, especially on movements that are most difficult in that shortened position. That will likely cause more hypertrophy. In certain exercise choices, you have to make a decision between getting more of a stretch or having more tension in a lengthened position. For example, a preacher curl versus an incline curl. When given this choice, and you don't have any other choices, I would go for the one that places more tension in the somewhat stretched position overpicking the one that just prioritizes muscle length at the expense of tension. And the final takeaway is that we see quite a bit more hypertrophy across several studies now when focusing on the stretch. In this case, we saw between 50 to 170% more hypertrophy in the case of the calves and quads. And there are several studies now by Cassiano and colleagues, for example, by Pedrosa and colleagues, and the recent conference abstract by Mayo and colleagues, often finding like 50 to 100% more hypertrophy or essentially up to twice as much hypertrophy from doing lengthened partials versus full range of motion. And so in light of this research, also finding between 50% and 170% more hypertrophy, this really suggests there's something to be had with the lengthened position. If you're not somewhat focusing on the lengthened position for hypertrophy at this point, you're likely missing out on hypertrophy. And I wanna give one final takeaway from this research and other research I've recently looked at. I have a whole article on this topic coming out with strongbyscience.com soon, so keep an eye out. But I don't think that lengthened training, like for example, lengthened partials, benefit you through stretch-mediated hypertrophy, as stretch-mediated hypertrophy occurs from stretching a muscle to its maximum length. And if anything, tension appears to be more important than just purely maximizing muscle length. But that is not the same as stretch-mediated hypertrophy. That is the video, breaking down this recent monster study that we conducted on the lengthened position for hypertrophy. If you like the video, please comment, like, subscribe, letting me know what else you want to see me break down. And here comes a plug. We are actually releasing a training app that has been years in development that is the most evidence-based and, to be honest, the best training app out there. Why is it the best? Well, we actually take results from the evidence and directly incorporate it into how the app works. What training it's giving you, 
is directly evidence-based. For example, based on this recent research around a lengthened position, we made sure that the app gives you exercises that focuses on the stretch position. And in fact, the app actually ranks exercises for you based on how effective they are, based on the evidence we have. And when more and more of this evidence came out over the past few years, suggesting that lengthened position is really important for hypertrophy, we actually modified how the app works. So when you use MyAdapt, you can be pretty sure that the training you're getting is cutting edge as far as the science is concerned. We've been working for years on this and we're aiming to make this like an evidence-based high-level coach in your pocket at a fraction of the price of actual coaching. The app gives you individualized muscle growth programs that get better week upon week as you give it feedback. The app is coming out within the next few months. So if you're interested in being notified when it does come out, check out myodapt.com and sign up to be notified via email when we release it. By signing up early, you'll be able to lock in a lower price than anyone else. In the meantime, if you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and we can become coaching client. Until the next video, have a great day and I'll see you next time. Peace.